Hello and welcome to The Point. I'm Marcel Weider. Today on The Point, commercializing innovations is what the Mars Discovery District was set up for nearly 15 years ago. Much like Silicon Valley in California, Silicon Alley in New York, and Kendall Square in Boston, Mars helps innovative companies find funding and mentor them through their startup. Dr. Zaina Kayat from the Mars Health joins us to discuss more. And melanoma is one of the fastest growing forms of cancer. Over 5,000 cases are diagnosed annually in Canada. Annette Sear, chair of the Melanoma Network of Canada, is here to discuss how people can protect themselves and what issues they're working on. All that and more on this edition of The Point. The Mars Discovery District is one of the leading centers for the commercialization of research in Canada. It's a hive for innovators who are doing cutting edge research that spans several different sectors. With the provincial government's recent announcement of an investment of $20 million in a health technology innovation evaluation fund, these startups are expected to receive a boost. I'm joined by Dr. Zaina Kayat from the Mars Innovation Center. Pleasure having you, Doctor. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about the Mars Center? Yeah, so we call it Mars Discovery District. And Mars was created back in 1999, 2000, to be a home and a hub to convert those discoveries into useful products, solutions, technologies to actually solve big problems that society faces, primarily and initially in health, hence Mars, medical and related sciences, but the related comes in now in the evolution of Mars, any uh, idea or invention in a technical technological area, Mars is the home to come and convert that into something useful that actually creates economic value for society. Now we've seen similar hubs in the U.S. I'm thinking in Boston, yeah. in California, in, in uh, Silicon Valley. They've taken academic research and changed it and applied it into a commercialization. Yeah, so those hubs we call clusters, and there's mm -hmm. a whole literature around economic development being focused around clusters, where you concentrate all those strong assets, mm -hmm. but it's regional. It always is. You can't have an entire country have a cluster. Mm -hmm. Hence, it's a region like Silicon Valley, as you mentioned, in California. There's Silicon Alley in other areas. Minneapolis has coined Life Sciences mm -hmm. Alley, so they focus on the biomedical. And of course, Boston and the Cambridge area, we might call that Kendall Square in many mm -hmm. ways. And so this is the natural evolution for Canada's hub, primarily in biomedical, but now Mars has evolved, as I said, to really high tech as a cluster and a hub. And so you mentioned academic research. It always starts there. That's where the discoveries are. That's what the public sector's investment has been into R&D and what we call STEM right. uh, related sciences. So, but you need many more ingredients to actually produce, let's say the next Blackberry or the next Genentech out of that academic science. You need capital. It's on an uptick if you look at the data, venture capital. And the third thing, though, you need is talent. Uh, entrepreneurial, been there, done that, who can take an idea and make a company. And then the fourth is you need all the rest of big industry. You can't just have startups from academia that are capitalized, even with great talent. You need them all. All that is now surrounding the Mars Discovery District. And we really feel that it's going to pop in the next five years on the back of the last 15 years. Now, you're partnering up with other companies that help mentor those people who have the startups in Mars. Is yeah. that correct? So we, we have a few ways to provide advice to these young companies. So you kind of need two things. You need to build founders, mm -hmm. teach them how to start and grow and scale a company, and they need to build great companies. There's technology risk, there's financial risk, right. there's a lot of capital needed. So we can't do that alone with our resources at Mars. So we bring in external uh, volunteer as well as paid advisors, mm -hmm. or we access 
senior companies, been there, done that entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and wrap all this advice around them. And a portion of those startups we also incubate physically in the Mars complex, mm -hmm. although the majority of the model, we work with about a thousand startups. That many? Uh, about a thousand, yeah. 300 in health, about 200 in clean tech, and the rest are in, in tech industries. Mm -hmm. um, about 100 uh, are physically close to us at Mars. The rest are served in a virtual model. So give us an indication or an idea of some of the types of projects that Mars is helping to incubate. Yeah, so, so I mentioned we work with about 1,000 young startups. And that's across tech and clean tech and health. I'll give you one example. You might know somebody who's been through an experience called the pap smear. It's the way we screen for cervical cancer, particularly when women are first sexually active. That's the time you're supposed to go for your first mm -hmm. pap smear. For very obvious reasons, the average normal woman who's even you know, perhaps highly health uh, literate and educationally literate avoids that experience. It is not the nicest experience. When it goes unscreened, if you develop cervical cancer, it is highly terminal. The, the prognosis is not good. If you catch it early, you don't get cervical cancer. Eve Medical is one of the companies we support that developed a home self-swab that replaces the pap smear. Mm -hmm. So think of the um, uh, pregnancy test. Who could imagine if you had to go somewhere to get a pregnancy test? You just go to shoppers and you buy it. That would be the model here. It completely opens accessibility to wide-based population screening, particularly for those populations who are not going to access the traditional go to a hospital and meet an obstetrician. So that's one of our, our really exciting young health companies. And that was a student from OCAD University who really? used a design approach mm -hmm. to take on an experience that is not comfortable for average society. So they've been doing quite well and in getting interest all over the world, in Europe and in China and including in Canada. So tell me about the EXCITE program that you head up. Yeah, so EXCITE is an acronym. It stands for Excellence in Clinical Innovation and technology evaluation. What that means is this, medicine is evidence-based. We don't just read something that some celebrity endorsed and then adopt that into our medical system. Mm -hmm. That's not how it rolls. Um, there needs to be quite a high grade of evidence of what technologies do and don't work. That is very difficult to produce. It's a clinical trial. It costs millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. If you're a young Ontario startup who all your focus is building a great company or a great technology. You've never done this before. Uh, and so Excite is a program that sits between the young innovator who needs to build some very, mm -hmm. very credible high grade evidence of uh, does this actually work when I give it to a patient uh, that's academically defensible. Uh, and with the Ontario Health System, who we work with to pick what technologies they want to go into the EXCITE program mm -hmm. because they're relevant to Ontario patients. And we broker a process between the company, mm -hmm. academia, of which we have mm -hmm. incredible academic infrastructure to evaluate medicine, and the Ontario Health System. It's the world first, and what we call it a pull model for health innovation. When you see all the jokes and the criticism of things like pharma sales reps, Right. The reason medical companies have reps that sell is because we don't have an automatic window to get technologies into the system mm -hmm. after they're proven to be valuable. So they they flood the street with reps who are selling, and they're, that's a push model of innovation. Right. Excite says, uh-uh. The Ontario Health System declared this is a major gap. This company has a solution. It's a pull model for health innovation. The world has taken notice of this very interesting way to collaborate between academia, industry, and the government. We are now replicating the EXCITE model in the US, in the UK, and in other countries. Really? It's a made in Ontario, I guess, an innovation, the process. How critical is it that there's you know, good government support behind these uh, efforts? Government's role in producing the next generation economy which for Ontario, for Canada, will be the knowledge economy, mm -hmm. which is actually the innovation economy as we transition from an industrial economy. It's an absolute vital role. And, and you know, government federally and provincially and municipally was at the table in the inception of Mars more than 15 years ago mm -hmm. and continue to invest uh, in this, this critical, what we call the valley of death, right? Converting from cool discovery into value in my case, for patients, right. for our health system, mm -hmm. but there's always a third value proposition, which is 
the economy. These are going to be the next generation jobs that my kids are going to be uh, hired into and, mm -hmm. and your kids and your family as we move away from you know, what have been the traditional source of jobs in the, in the industrial economy. Well, Dr. Zaina Kayak from the Mars Discovery District, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back in a moment. According to the Melanoma Network of Canada, out of every three cancer diagnoses, one of those will be for skin cancer. Melanoma is the most deadly form of skin cancer and it's currently the fastest growing cancer worldwide. However, early detection can increase chances of survival. Anit Sear, Chair of the Melanoma Network Canada, is here for more. Thank you for joining us, Annette. My pleasure. Thank you. So Annette, what led you to found the Melanoma Network? Well, you know, part of it was because I was a patient myself. I was originally diagnosed in 2001, and then it came back in 2007 and recurred. And at that time, I was looking for some resources, some information, and sadly, there was just so little available out there. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't believe it. I, I actually thought melanoma, I must be the only patient in Canada. I really, for a moment, thought I was the only patient. There was nobody, it, nothing happening. I, I was actually in, in my surgeon's clinic and the nurse handed me a pamphlet uh, from Canadian Cancer Society mm -hmm. for non-melanoma patients. And I thought, this is, this is such an unhelpful gesture <laughs> in so many ways. So I thought, you know, if I made it out of that in one piece, that I would do something to try and um, make resources available to patients and be able to at least answer some questions for people. Um, you know, when they leave an office and have mm -hmm. so many questions, they need somebody to be able to reach out to and maybe get some information in a timely manner. Now, melanoma is one of the fastest growing cancers that uh, we're seeing in Canada. Is that correct? That's right. We say grow fastest growing. It is um, actually a very aggressive form of cancer as well. But it's the seventh most frequently occurring cancer in the country, yet still has a very low profile, um, partly because, it, you know, we have about between six and 7,000 cases a year um, of, of melanoma. But that number is on the rise. And what we're seeing in other cancers, such as breast cancer and prostate, mm -hmm. is a decrease in the actual numbers. So it's good that all of those maybe detections and, and treatment uh, therapies are now, you know, reducing the actual numbers out there. But melanoma is, is on the rise, not only in Canada, but worldwide. Now, as I understand it, melanoma is one of the most preventable types of cancer, that there are things that you can do to prevent being at risk from melanoma. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we don't want to fault anybody for developing a mm -hmm. cancer, but we do know that for the majority of um, superficial spreading uh, melanomas, which is the most common type of melanoma, mm -hmm that the majority of them, the vast majority of them, are caused by UV radiation. So that's UV radiation either from the sun or from tanning beds. You have a program out there that's trying to reach, during the summer, campers and people who are outdoors. Right. Right. Last year, we, we undertook a pilot project with, um, with the support of the Ontario Camp Association. And we enrolled, um, I think, it's about 17 um, pilot camps mm -hmm. um, across the province. And these are a variety of camps. And uh, what the, this pilot program involved was really having the, the camps themselves assess the environment um, uh, in which they're operating. So where the camp is, does the camp have um, easy shade access? Do they try to plan um, activities? Activities where possible outside of the peak mm -hmm. hours of UV radiation. Is there a sun safety policy there? Mm -hmm. Do they do the staff and and camp camp, camp counselors know um, what to be able to tell the, the uh, age appropriate levels of, of campers um, what to do about sun safety and what type of opportunity they have as far as educating those campers? So it's a prime opportunity for us because there's such a big population of, of children and youth in this province that go to summer camps. Mm -hmm. And what we want them to do is have an enjoyable experience outdoors, but do it safely. 
um, in these peak years of youth, they're so susceptible to developing skin mm -hmm. cancers and melanomas. And oftentimes these don't show up until later in life. We pay for our, our sins a little bit right. later, unfortunately. But, you know, we thought if we can try to motivate and, and show them how easy it is to incorporate this behavior in their daily activities, then hopefully by the time they're teenagers or, or young adults, we're not fighting with them to try to get the message of sun safety across. And you mentioned just a moment ago about tanning beds. Yes. Your organization was at the forefront to have tanning beds uh, banned. It was uh, the first uh, municipality, I believe, was Oakville, followed by Mississauga, and then a number of others. Yep. Is that correct? Absolutely. That was a bit of a, a, th a thorn in my side. I mean, I, I, uh, we've known for years the dangers of tanning beds, but I think the gr greater population doesn't really understand the intensity of UV radiation that is found in those beds. And not only is there you know, UVB, the type of burning mm -hmm. rays within tanning beds, but there's a high concentration of UVA as well. And UVA is suspected to be the leading cause of genetic damage. So so damage mm -hmm. at the DNA level that your, your body can't necessarily repair. Mm. And if you keep damaging that computer, it, eventually it's going to malfunction and, and potentially cause cancer. People also ask, why didn't you just go for an outright ban? Um, difficult, difficult to undertake. Uh, you know, I think uh, the groundswell of public opinion is certainly potentially not with us on that. But we thought at least if we could prevent access to youth under the age of 18, we would be at least setting in place a, a platform to have an outright ban um, established at some mm -hmm. point in the not too distant future when everybody wakes up to, to realize this is just not a healthy uh, recreation. Having a tan is not a healthy option for people and tanning beds just contribute with their high intensity. They're actually up to eight to ten times stronger than the midday sun. Really? So the type of intense UV radiation that you're getting can really spark issues and create not only melanomas but other forms like basal cell carcinoma. And there are some new and innovative uh, drugs and procedures that are available to uh, people diagnosed with melanoma, yet the health system is not providing access to these. A few years back, the, the federal government uh, worked with the province to come up with a new drug approval process for cancer drugs uh, in the country uh, called the Pan-Canadian Drug Oncology mm -hmm. Review. So once a, a, a drug is given the okay by Health Canada, the Pan-Canadian on, uh, Oncology Drug Review takes a look at it to actually see if it's something that they can support um, the province's paying or they mm -hmm. make the recommendation to the provinces whether or not they should um, support it. So uh, the P-coder process takes you know upwards 130, 160 days once they've received the NOC uh, from Health mm -hmm. Canada, but eventually they do you know, have to cut off and draw mm -hmm. the line. Sometimes this has been drawn out for years and, uh, you know, it, it, it comes a point in time when they have to, you know, uh, account to their shareholders as well. So, you know, we've had situations in the past where there has been a, you know, a lag between approval times for coverage in the province and the pharmaceutical cutting people off compassionate access. And what happens in that, that case, and I know of one specific case in, in, mm -hmm. in Oakville actually, where the family almost lost their house because mm. the cost of the drug therapy was uh, about $12,000 a month. And we don't think that that happens in Canada. We don't think that we have to pay those kind of um, fees for drugs that um, have some potential, if not curative effect, a, um, a, a long, increasing the longevity mm -hmm. of life. And if you or I are in those situations, we want access to those drugs. Sure. And so if we have to incur on top of it the stress of uh, having to pay out of pocket, that's a big concern. Mm -hmm. But even so, with the, the new drug approval process, um, provinces have a, an opportunity to review and see if they can fit the drug cost within their budget. And for the most part, I'd have to say that Ontario is pretty good. They, they, they fall behind a little bit behind mm -hmm. uh, BC and maybe Alberta uh, t tends to go a little bit ahead of us, but we're, we're usually not too much uh, far behind. But there is still an issue of out-of-pocket expense for people that have even a copay with a private insurer. So, right. if, for instance, if you have insurance with your company mm -hmm. to cover this this um, cost, it might be at 80% and, and oftentimes is. That's or right. has a lifetime yep. ca cap on it. If it has a lifetime cap, there's a few of these new drug therapies uh, called immunotherapies that are taken until... 
So there's no end point. They're taken basically for life or until you have a recurrence of disease and hopefully you're on to the next thing. So potentially you could run through that lifetime cap pretty quickly or if you have a copay and the drug is $120,000 a year, you still have to pick up a portion of that cost. And for mm -hmm. the average wage earner, that is just sometimes out of reach and out of means, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's a big concern for us. What are some of the things that people should be looking at? 12 months a year you should be looking at protecting your skin. Um, we're the color of skin we are because of where our ancestors came from. If people came, you know, from the uh, tropical climes mm -hmm. or closer to the equator, um, you know, darker skin was a built-in protection factor in our evolution that helped to at least provide some, some protection for, for those people. But even dark skin people uh, with, uh, you know, uh, dark skin only have about a 13% sun protection factor in, in, from that skin. Mm -hmm. Most of us were from lighter skin climes and that, that develop melanoma and the lighter you are, light eyes, light hair, you know, you, you have a higher risk for developing skin cancer. When you're outdoors in winter, there's, uh, uh, you know, eight to ten times higher reflection off of sun, off mm -hmm. of, sorry, snow and ice and, and in the winter. So, you know, you need to wear protection if you're skiing and such. But summer, we tend to be bare, you know. <laughs> We're not our, our parents where we still had full cover up at the beach and hats and everything else. Well, we're encouraging people to adopt a little bit of that common sense approach mm -hmm. and, and still wearing the hats uh, where you can put on sun protection clothing, so longer sleeves and, and, and pants if possible. If not, anything that's exposed should be having regular applications of a full spectrum sunscreen and of course protect your eyes as well. What type of resources are available for people to learn more about and if they've been unfortunately diagnosed with it? What type of support can they uh, get through the melanoma network? Well, we're small, but we're mighty, you know, <laughs> that's the one thing I say. We span the country, so we do get calls from right across the country um, from patients, and they're often in these critical hours of need. It's very, very difficult to oftentimes to get a hold of anyone at the hospital, your, your doctor to return a call, if you even have a number for them. Mm -hmm. You most you know, most often don't. So at least we're there. We're, we're somebody that you can email or call and find some information. And I've got emails this morning already from patients who are in dire need and having confusion around mm -hmm. their diagnosis, their access. What are the next steps? The, the worst part, and I'll, I'll tell you this, physicians will say the same thing who've been diagnosed with cancer and, and go through it, is they never realize how much the waiting causes stress and anxiety for patients. It's sitting there waiting weeks oftentimes to get a report back on a, a pathology report or staging and appointments and you can be waiting an enormous amount of time and it's just really, really a stressful time for patients. Mm -hmm. So we provide that information. We have a very fulsome website, probably the best website in, in the world, I would say, on information on melanoma and you know available resources in the country. And that website address is? www.melanomanetwork.ca. We also have our screenme.ca website for kids, for youth access, all about the mm -hmm. CAMP program. And uh, we have all sorts of resources printed, uh, written, newsletters. We've got an online forum that patients can join on and talk to other patients and share experiences mm -hmm. and ask questions, so that's a helpful thing. Annette Sear, founder and chair of the Melanoma Network Canada, thank you for joining me today. With the warm weather, it's great to be outdoors. Recently, I had the opportunity to play golf with one of my boys and spend the other day with the family at the Ontario Nature Annual Meeting at the Rare Charitable Research Reserve near Cambridge. This 1,000 acre reserve on the banks of the Grand River offered a chance to hike and explore forests and wetlands. For my boys, it was an opportunity to look for salamanders and snakes. And more importantly, it was a chance to unplug from the iPads, iPhones, and iPods. Too often, we take for granted what a diverse and beautiful province we have, from the rugged beauty of the north to the lakes and rivers enjoyed by many. Our Niagara Escarpment has been designated a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve. A significant part of the Bruce Trail passes through that reserve. With more than 80% of Ontarians living in urban centers, we sometimes forget about some of the most beautiful, significant land is nearby. 
But with urban sprawl, that land is under threat. Ten years ago, the Ontario government created the Greenbelt to preserve and protect environmentally sensitive areas outside of Toronto. Earlier this year, a review began on the Greenbelt along with the Oak Ridge's Moraine and the Niagara Escarpment. These studies will help manage growth, protect the environment, and support economic development in these regions for the next decade. Yet it is organizations like Ontario Nature, Rare, and others that are the true guardians of our environment. They help promote and defend the land and its inhabitants from the constant threat of development, pollution, and dismantling of sensitive ecosystems. The volunteers, donors, and professionals who help keep Ontario's beauty preserved for future generations deserve our admiration and thanks. So take some time this summer to enjoy the gift that has been bestowed on us. Unplug and unwind and reconnect with the beauty that is Ontario. And that's the point. That's all for this edition of The Point. Keep up with us on Twitter at Watch The Point, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Marcel Weider. Thank you for joining us.